Distortion. And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 116. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Susan, I don't think you would be able to guess... Because, I mean, you probably know what your husband's playing, perhaps, if you haven't uh, heard a song yet. Maybe you just know his style. But uh, a friend of yours did our theme songs, and then that uh, theme song, and that's uh, Mike Squires. Oh, yeah. Squires. That's what I call him. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm loaded. And, uh, and, and he offered to do this theme song for me. So I figured that might be a nice little segue into our, our conversation. Because I feel like, I don't know, people joke sure. that I, I keep talking around the, the orb of of Duff because I interviewed uh, both Bruce and Matt. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, uh -huh. And I I said my a joke. Brother in law. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. made and I made that joke that both of, my, both of them my brother in law actually. Yeah, right. Super sweet, of course. Squires, mm -hmm. uh, Rouse. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, from Loader Rousey. as well. Mm -hmm. And then you, <laughs> it just it's like this awesome extended family, and you know, uh -huh. and I'm appreciative of just again your time because every everyone's time I, I I'm thankful for, but. Uh, seeing you, especially on social media, and maybe that could be the the awkward way I get into my uh, interviews. Social media is a blessing and a curse. Uh, you, sure. I don't know your time. I don't know how you have any. So I, I just can't thank you enough for taking <laughs> Susan Holmes McKagan. Welcome officially. Uh, thank you for for coming on. Oh well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's it's a lot of fun to get to talk to you, and um, we have fun following you, and, huh. and I love hearing your fascinating and compelling stories with Mike Squires and Jeff Rouse and and Bruce and Matt McKagan and now I get to be on here too so that's really exciting and cool so thanks again I don't know maybe I still yeah I'm in radio but I still have that fanboy in me I'm like really <laughs> you know it's not even just like the G don't we all though yeah <laughs> it's but not even like the GNR tie of it I'm like I'm talking to a pretty girl I still have that 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 kind of a part of me <laughs> uh, in me as well but where to even get started? You you do so much, and are mm -hmm. we officially? We can now officially add and you know to, to model and an actress. We officially now add author to your your resume to your yes. business card. Yes, it is pretty darn exciting. I mean, it's it's really happening. I, I worked so tremendously hard and for so long. I don't know how much you know or not, but I've been working on this novel that's finally completed and officially being launched on April 16th. I'll be at the Strand Bookstore in New York and Duff will be there and I have a super fun mob moderator. It's Miss J. Alexander from America's Next Top Model and he has a huge cult following too and it's just going to be a lot of fun and I've just been working for a very, very long time on this and writing and rewriting and pitching and repitching and getting rejections and then rewriting and you know it's not it's not like poof oh and she has a book out okay <laughs> so it's really rewarding and and kind of cathartic for me to actually kind of speak about it at length for any other aspiring writers or people that you know want to have a novel published or tell their story I guess no, absolutely and I'm fascinated because before I was bit by the theoretical radio book. I wanted to be a journalist or an author. You know, I, I've tried to sit down and write, you know, everyone thinks that they have their story, but not everyone is Duff McKagan or Slash that has, has a, a story other people want to read or has a name that can get the, the attention of it all. Um, but hey, just to sit down for myself, just to rewrite it and, and, to, and, and to shelve it for years. So how long did the egg is how long it took for you? And I'm curious. Nine years. <laughs> nine? Nine years. Wow, yeah. nine so times. It was, it, was, uh, it was a really um, very long process. And um, so, you know, when you work 
that hard and that long at something and it finally comes to fruition, I guess, you know, you really, truly appreciate it that much more and feel that much more proud of it. And I feel like it's right. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very vulnerable thing to do to write a book kind of, and, and put your work out there in, um, in a book and spoken word and, you know, it's, um, did you do anything like this beforehand? Cause it's, if it's your first book, did you ever, uh-huh. uh, like, like Duff has articles. Yeah. You, have you ever, yeah, no, forgive me for not knowing. Yeah. Oh, no, no worries. Um, I, uh, write for the Huffington post and I initially started writing for them Okay. to get my writing chops going again. Um, I started writing for them, I think almost four years ago. And I initially started writing kind of fun columns on um, insightful tips on anything from traveling to weddings to music to fashion, et cetera. And okay. then it kind of slowly transformed into a fun platform for me, kind of similar to you, where I got to interview um, some pretty amazing guests um, or like celebrity guests. And um, then those interviews and columns turned into the front page cover stories for Huffington Post. Okay. So I saw um, it ramping up to stronger, you know, literary success (laughs) slowly but surely there, as well as writing for another, um, another um, company called Pop Wrapped. And that was all in pop culture stuff. And I did some fun things with them and that helped me get my, you know, writing chops going again and figuring out what worked for me, um, the formula or system, you know, when to write, um, when to rewrite, you know, how to do my outlines, how to, um, kind of be more concise in my writing. Sure. Word economy. That's something even while speaking. Yes. Word economy. I love that. Yes. That's yeah. My first uh, production dire- uh, program director in Cape Cod said, because I'm a talkative, you know, Long Island. I, I got to, even when I edit these podcasts, <laughs> I'm like, I just wasted an extra 30 seconds to get to my point. I got to be honest. I'm like, I can, yeah. I can do that better. So yeah, writing is difficult. That's it's why. An art. I, it's, you, oh yeah. Like a a lost art. <laughs> In, in today's world, it's a lost art. Right, right, exactly. So, I mean, it's just like anything in life. The more you practice and, and the more you read, the better writer you will become. And, you know, I definitely, it was hard. I did get a lot of rejection initially, and I got a lot of constructive criticism feedback. But I wanted to hear that feedback. You know, my lit agent in New York was like, do you want to hear it or do you just want to know who said no and who said maybe? (laughs) And I said, no, I really want to hear because I really want to know what I'm doing wrong or what that person's subjective opinion didn't like in my writing. Mm. And maybe I'll agree, maybe I won't. But, you know, it only made me stronger. And being my background being in, you know, modeling for so many years and, around us and the spotlight, et cetera. I mean, I definitely probably have a pretty good thick skin than most, you know, mm-hmm. sure. authors going into this. <laughs> you know, when you're a model, you get rejected like 20 times to your oh, own th- thing at least. I so mean, it's nothing for me. I'm afraid <laughs> just with like, yeah, writing or putting my podcast or you know, being on air. But mm-hmm. I got to be honest, the physical aspect, I mean, that's something that, I mean, that may be to be that to get through that. That's got to be the toughest. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah. that'll be the yeah, toughest no, barrier. It's hard. I know people are always like, oh, models are so stuck up. You know, they must be really full of themselves. They're arrogant. I'm like, well, quite the contrary. We literally know every single square inch of our body and what's wrong with it and how it, people, someone didn't mm. like it to book us for a job <laughs> that we auditioned for. So it kind of. Yeah, you have to build thick skin. See, that's worse because so. you can edit what you write or you can adjust it, but you can't. Your body exactly. is your body. Okay, sure. Yeah, so it's, it's um yeah, I mean, like I said, you're it's very courageous when you put yourself out there in a different format that, you know, is a new endeavor. And I think in this day and age, people change careers and goals all the time. That's more and more and more common. So... Um, yeah, it was tough, but 
I'm really excited for the book. I think a lot of people will really enjoy it. It's a really fast paced page turning novel. Um, it has a, a lot of fun. Um, it's sort of a warts and all <laughs> unvarnished Ramona Clay type of book. So rock and roll fans will absolutely dig reading it. I think people who are um, interested in fashion will think it's cool. I think people who just want to see kind of a rock and roll biopic, but told through kind of the a female version or eyes is kind of fun and different from oh, all yeah. the other ones out there. So I think that's what it can add to the table. Cause right now, as you know, you know, the rock and roll biopic, are so big from A Star Is Born, Bohemian Rhapsody, The Dirt, you know, they're mm-hmm. all killing it. And they're all told through the male paradigm. So I think I can offer some different insights. The Captain Marvel <laughs> answer. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's, inter- uh, that's interesting. And is it the obvious that it's called the Velvet Rose for Velvet Revolver and yeah, Guns N' Roses? Okay. Exactly. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say right what you know about. So that's pretty much what I did. And then, of course, it's, you know, various stories and blended characters. And um, because in a novel, typically a novel takes place in the arc of 12 months. So, you know, if you were to really, truly do a GNR (laughs) biopic or a VR one, I mean, you couldn't do it in a book or a novel anyway. Because mm. you have to have a beginning, middle, and end, and you know an arc in the story, and a rise, fall, rise, and all that. So for an order to like piece together and make sense and be entertaining and not, you know, like a historical outline, <laughs> that's how a fiction novel has to be done. Right on, and that's good that you faced rejection. Lord knows I faced plenty, and I think that just makes you you stronger in the long run. Uh, but since you've written before. But with this kind of being somewhat based on real life, yeah. but this you're mm-hmm. using characters, but the characters sound mm-hmm. similar. So the ca- characters seem to be a port- uh, are they a, a true interpretation of what seems to be you and Duff, or or, or what kind of creative license are you going with since you're using characters? I don't know. I, I think guess. you have to read the book. Uh, <laughs> Fair <laughs> I enough. Mean, it is called The Velvet Rose, and. As I mentioned, write what you know about, but it is a novel. Um, It is fiction. It is, um, I guess, I can't imagine any writer not writing some semblance of themselves and what they've gone through in life or witnessed or encountered or experienced. So, you know, by symbiosis, how could you not feel, you know, um, stories being told from things you've, been through right so sure. i guess what made you make the choice not to make an, auto, an autobiography and i i kind of like uh-huh. that you didn't i like that it, it is a story right. that that you, you that it leaves that mystery like is this true is this not and it leaves your well, mind kind of the fun of it i think yeah yeah, yeah. Figure out things and um and it's not just one band it's two so, <laughs> and many more so you know my husband's been in you know gosh I've been with him almost 20 years. So I've been with him, you know, from the early GNR days to, you know, Loaded to Velvet Revolver. He was in Jane's Addiction, you know, for a while. Um, All right. uh, Hollywood Vampires, you know, um, Kings of Chaos. So (laughs) there's been a lot of tours I've been on and I'm really blessed. I've gotten to, you know, see and hear some of the most incredible music live and, you know, be around these cool, very talented, inspiring people, and um, and their their girlfriends and their wives and their kids and all that stuff. So I guess I have a lot, a lot of um, a lot of good stuff to write about. I'm very blessed. <laughs> How did you look at it as far as, um, cause you're talking about families too. And I, I, you know, yes, because it's part of the the podcast, why I, I follow your family on Instagram. I'm not a complete weirdo. Uh, but oh. <laughs> I mean, well, thank you. <laughs> but <appreciate that. laughs> but your, your, your daughters are, are thriving as well in their own respective careers, you know, yes, with, with the yes, pink slips and, and, mm-hmm. and, and may with her, yeah. her modeling. So it's like, yep. how did you, 
or did you at all involve your kids into your stories with, with Duff or your, the, those characters? Were they, was being a mom involved in that? Because I know it's, you can make two sure. different stories of, of a, your, the perspective of yeah. a mom, right? Or just a perspective right. of a wife or a girl growing up. Well, There's a lot of perspectives to take. This book in order to tell a story that's truly unhinged and like, there's just nothing holding back. I mean, I call it sort of a front row seat of fun debut. <laughs> I think, I, I think with my publisher on rare bird, they, he said, um, you know, I think sometimes you can tell more by a person's story through fiction than you can through an autobiography because there are no fences. There is nothing holding me back. Mm. You know, I, I think you can, have a little more freedom sometimes <clears throat> and not hurt anyone or I don't know. It's just, um, it's a different, um, instrument you're playing, I guess. <laughs> um, no, I like that. It's, 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 it's you can kinda... play the same song on piano, but you can also play it on, you know, an acoustic guitar, you know, and they're the same song, but told through different versions. So mm. I, it'll be interesting to see I think because there's been so many great autobiographies and I am a mom, you know, I am a wife, I'm a rock fan. I am a world traveler. I was, you know, a big fashion model for many years living in Paris and New York. And, mm. and my book is set in the early nineties. So I think oh, it's okay. extra, extra cool because I don't know about you, but like the early nineties to me, that was, America was really vibrant then. I mean, it was a time of like peace and prosperity and it was the end of apartheid. And it was when those Eastern European cities became unhinged and, you know, there's different people in the office, stuff like that. So it was just a really cool time in music. I mean, it's probably one of the last real rock and roll bands that was signed and put out music and had albums coming out and people listened to them and knew like a bunch of the songs on the album, not just one song, you know, it was when the World Wide web was made public, you know? So right. there was a lot happening then musically. So it was really fun to pick that era and pay an homage to it. Well, that's cool. Like, it, like, uh, yeah. uh, like in set, that's, yeah, that's important to, I guess, to know the, the, the time period because you've experienced so many different, Time periods, and I'm I'm with you on the '90s. I'm yeah. rocking my my flannel that I wore yesterday. Oh, good. So. Yeah. Well, now it's come full circle, hasn't it? So it's good. Just bring it back out. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're be eco friendly. Recycle the fashion. <laughs> you know what? I, I I couldn't believe. I don't know how much uh, TV you watch or Netflixing you watch, but I guess uh, so. A lot. <laughs> uh, do you know the show You? Yes, I love that show. I was absolutely addicting, and that kid, the uh, actor, is fantastic he's such a great actor so believable now yeah and if you notice the um i want people to watch it it, it, it is good but the girl in it like the main girl she was wearing she's amazing a, too a nirvana yeah. t-shirt with like you okay. know a grandpa sweater over it and she had mm-hmm. long blonde hair i'm like she's just a female kurt cobain and she this is a new yeah. show <laughs> it's the, yeah, yeah so that was my little side story of agreeing with you yes things come yeah yeah no you're seeing, we're seeing it more and more and that it was funny i when I was writing this book, if you think about it, I started nine years ago. I had it set in the 90s then, hoping that once this book was released, I'd hit it on the nose with it being of trend or, you know, of importance and interest. Because um, I, not that it's of any comparison or whatever at all, but, like, think of artists that do that, and you try and look in the time machine and figure out when to, put something out so it'll be relevant and kind of hit its mark. No, that makes it's sense. I am like Prince wrote 1999 and then when it came out, you know what I mean? And then how it, people played it again. So I wanted to write something that in like the future, when the book finally was released, it would be like a good time. And that's hard to do as an artist because you could be way ahead of the game and nobody gets it, or you could be super behind and like, they're like, Oh, that's so three years ago. We're into the two thousands now. Or <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have to put it out when it's out. Like you don't it's know. Not, it's like at the right time. Also, <laughs> I got lucky on that. That's why it was interesting. The last, um, uh, episode I did when I was speaking with Alex Grassi from hookers and blow said how long it took oh, for, yeah. for Dizzy to put out his record. So how long did it take him? Uh, I wish I probably I should probably know that off the top of my head since I just spoke to him, but 
Uh, I don't sleep much. I, it was a while, maybe like five years. Yeah, it was, oh, it was wow. years. It was years. It was years. It was a while ago. Aww. Uh, yeah. So that. Crazy, huh? So did you ever imagine? I guess when you were, where, like, where did you grow up? By the way, if I may ask. Oh, okay. Well, I grew up. I'm like a gypsy. I grew up <laughs> initially in a really small little college town in the Midwest called Bro- uh, sorry, Bowling Green, Ohio. Oh, okay. Football and, town, right? Yeah. 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 Falcons. And um, it was a great place to grow up because you like, knew your neighbors in a small town in Midwest. And like, it really gave me a strong like moral compass. And people there are just so down to earth and genuinely nice. And... Um, my dad was a professor there at the university at BGSU. So, um, oh, cool. it was cool, you know, oh, so I'm, you... I'm blessed. I, I had a really nice, you know, childhood upbringing. And then my parents were both educators. My mom actually was a mm. reading specialist and English teacher. So I grew up around the house with like, stuff will tell you this. Like I, if you need to know how to spell a word or punctuate a sentence, like, <laughs> I'm your go-to grammar police. You know, I got this. Um, so she also helped me instrumentally with, you know, becoming a, a, a writer and enjoying reading and just, you know, treasuring good books. So then when you were, uh, younger, cause today, I mean, I, I didn't, I never knew I would be, you know, in radio growing up when you're, I was younger. I think I, today as we're recording this, it's WrestleMania tonight. I wanted to be a wrestler, mm-hmm. but as a five, six person, I could be, you know, I could be a, yeah. ring, a ring post. I can't be a wrestler. Uh, so Aww. when you were young, never, never. <laughs> maybe when I was in, in the nineties, when I was a model, it was all about these supermodels and like you had to be five, eight or over. And then I remember one day in came Kate Moss and we were shooting the Dolce & Gabbana campaign. And it was like all of us really tall girls. And she walked in and I think she's five to seven. And we were like, Oh, okay. Cause you know, if you're we're with all these Amazon six feet tall women, in that world, that was kind of shorter, right? So sure. then after she, you know, obviously she's still such a huge icon. Then all these other sort of petite girls broke through in the mainstream and, you know, are mega, mega, mega. So stuff changes. Oh, of course. Boundaries, like fall down. So, you know. <laughs> Anything is possible. And that's, you know, what I want the theme exactly. of this episode to be, because with, with you and, and Duff and the, whole, and the McKagan brothers, because everyone is so nice and positive. It's missing in this world. Uh, but when you were younger, that's my, my point I was trying to get to with the terrible joke, was since mm-hmm. your, your parents were educators, did you always want to write a novel? Did you always want to tour with a, a rock star? Did you th- want to... You know, uh, not everyone is picked to be beautiful or did did you want to be my, what did you want to be? (laughs) Well, thanks. Um, Actually, you're going to think this is hilarious maybe, but I grew up, like I said, in my younger years in Bowling Green, Ohio. And like the claim to fame and BG was, uh, well, first of all, our main national kind of boulevard is Scott Hamilton Boulevard. And he's like this four time Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. He still does the, uh, I, I I know what is he? What is it the? What do you call it? The commentators? Wow, yeah. I couldn't think of that word. Yeah, he's still yeah, the commentators. Right, like for the Olympics and stuff. Sure. Yeah, he's really good. And so everyone there skates, like either hockey or figure. That's what you do because there's not a lot to do there except play sports, you know, <laughs> or mow lawns or <laughs> I don't know, uh-huh. um, teach at the university, I guess. But um, I so I grew up figure skating a lot, and that was like. When I was a little kid, I just thought, oh, that'd be so cool to one day, you know, get that good and be at that skater. level. Huh. So, but then like you, remember how you were just saying how you're five, six and the wrestling thing? Yeah, well, sure. Figure skater, it's not good to be tall. So mm-hmm. the reverse discrimination, <laughs> I was like, oh no. Fair. So um, I did get accepted into ice capades though. Okay. <laughs> okay. I ended up going to Paris and modeling, so... There's a glimmer of hope in there, but um, hey, if you know, if they ever do Guns N' Roses on Ice, I'm hoping you're going to yeah. be part of it. <laughs> I hope they pick me on it, have some sort of small part in it, right? That'd be so cool. That would be, <laughs> be the popcorn vendor. Oh, that would, that would... <laughs> so then, I guess when did you? Because you said it was nine years ago. When did you decide to hmm. do this? Uh, when did you sit down? It's not just like, hey, I have a deadline. For an article coming up, yeah. I'm going to invest well, my time into making a novel. Well, when you write a book, 
you have to, you don't just sit down and write a book. You, um, you, um, come up, you know, obviously you have your characters and your storyline and, um, you write an outline or at least for me, I'm all about a strong outline. And, um, then you only have to write the, the first two chapters in your book and then sort of a outline and a, and a brief overview. Mm. And that's what you use to pitch to the publishers. And, um, so I just worked, you know, as hard as I possibly could on making that as strong as possible and rewriting it a million times, of course. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, getting a nice literary agent and, um, there's, I mean, there's going to be stumbles for anyone. I, I, I can't, I think it was JK Rowling. I think she got rejected 44 times or something, right. For, um, Harry Potter, mm. books. <laughs> you know, and on and on and on, you know, so I, yeah, I often think of, it took, uh, Rodney Dangerfield. He was 50 before yeah. he became famous and he took not just him alone because he was selling a, aluminum siding was uh, he took oh, really? uh, yeah he like quit comedy and, and people brought him back in and he took oh. uh, Jim Carrey along on tour oh. with him and he kept getting booed like every night because he was too weird and, and Rodney's like keep oh. with it so yeah there's a there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of great stories in, 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 in persevering and that's why it's mm-hmm. good to hear you know people I don't want to say people like you, uh, the pigeonhole you to a certain sect of people, uh, <laughs> but you just to keep the success going. And even when you've already been successful and you've already hit, hey, I can enjoy my life to face rejection yeah. and still keep going. I think that's that says yeah. a lot because you could be like, ah, you know what? I tried. I have my life. But no, you keep you keep going because this was important to you. Right. Well, it was like a huge challenge. And uh, like you said, you have to have. You have to be tenacious and anyone out there wanting to get their novel published or write their book. Um, just remember the people judging you, the publishers, it's a subjective opinion, you know? Oh yeah. Um, and you know, each just like TV shows or movies, um, each network, Radio. Their own tone. Each radio station probably has their own tone. Oh, yeah. So tone is a key factor to remember, too. You know, you could pitch to, you know, Penguin is going to go for, you know, a certain type of book completely different from, you know, um, Simon & Schuster or, uh, you know what I mean? So you have to kind of know that when you're pitching and if they like it great if they don't know it might not fit into that particular publisher's wheelhouse or maybe they already have a book kind of similar storyline to yours so you know they're not going to have another one because it's just too close to home of another book they already signed so you can't take it so personal is what i'm trying to say it's like a label in a way probably yeah yeah exactly you know um, a sub pop's probably looking for something a little different than a capital or a universal. So yeah, you have to know that and just keep pitching, keep writing. I embrace the constructive criticism. Like it's just hilarious. One pub, one publisher was like, "Oh, in my first round of um, pitch pitches, they were like, oh, 'Oh, I'm not reading enough '90s.'" Um, hints of 90s in there i want to really feel like you know every other sentence like you know as he walked down the street in his doc martin boots and the you know the videotape was doing this or you know what i mean yeah he's got the walkman with the ace of bass in there okay yeah so i go back to drawing board and do that and cover it up with tons of 90s you know um imagery and Mm. Send it out again. They're like, oh, my God, this is way overly obviously trying to be 90. So my point is <laughs> stick true to what you really think it should be read first and foremost. But listen to others. But, you know, it's a weird balance. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no right or wrong. You know, I get what you're saying. Insane. But I am on a great publisher, Rare Bird. They're awesome. They're a really good fit. They've done some incredible books. They did the Studio 54 book, Monty Python. Um, they just um, brought on um, Sean Penn's 
next novel, which Steph interviewed Sean, you know, at the Moore Theater in yes. Seattle. That was mm-hmm. really cool. Um, Bella Thorne, they've got um, The Hummingbird, which I know has sold like 35,000 copies last year, to, um, they're cool, because they get art, music, fashion, and a little bit more edgy kind of books than your mainstream kind of commercial big six. That's what people want now anyway. That's why, yeah. it, that's how I, I look at, and I've, I've used the comparison like podcasts to radio, Netflix to cable, right. you know, it's just, yeah. it's, I don't know, I feel like creativity is making a, a comeback, so, right. which is, yeah. I shouldn't be saying, I mean, that should always be the... Well, I mean, they are, but, you know, I guess there's more um, freedom to for listeners or readers to figure out what they want to check out. Right. It's not as... We were just talking about that yesterday, even with music. Remember those, in the 90s, there was those those record clubs of the month, and you check the little box, the ones you want them to send you, <laughs> from Dick Clark or whatever. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Like, now you can go just turn on Spotify or SoundCloud and discover cool new artists. Yeah, wasn't you know, like a, like a penny a month? Like a penny a yeah. month for a yeah. CD? yeah. Remember you, this? Yeah. Yeah, you I'm get... I'm really dating myself now, but you know... You'd get the latest, like, Michael McDonald album. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably on the same one label or something. I'm sure, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know any of that stuff. Who it's did you... Mainstream. Who did you look up to as far as authors? Um, I, I oh, enjoy... Yeah. Um, uh-huh. I don't know if you read a lot of Mitch album, um, Tuesdays with Maury. Um, I don't read Yeah, a... I, I read that book. I mean, that, that one was really endearing. It was so sweet, and... Oh, Duff and I are huge dog lovers, so that one especially resonated. And then, of course, you saw the film, and that was good, too. Mm. Book's always better, but the film was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, for me, like, um, writing style, I adore Ernest Hemingway, of course, who does not um, a, mov- a movable feast with how he describes, you know, you can taste the foods that he's, you know, eating at you know, the oysters at the seashore and, you know, the sounds he's hearing and the smells. And so I just really adore and think his writing is very, um, I don't know, you really feel like you're there. Sure. It's a lot easier said than done. I think as an author, it's that's probably one of the biggest challenges for me as a writer is to not be too descriptive because you can write, Sally went to the seashore and ate oysters, or you can really make that person smell the air and taste the oysters and hear the sounds she's really hearing and stuff like that. So that's, that is the difference between a a good writer and a, and a brilliant writer. Agreed. I think that's why when I, I would read Mitch Albom's books that I'm like, I, I felt like I was there. I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. You know, I try to bring my storytelling to yeah. to radio, but no, it it is a challenge, and you certainly uh, are looking at the right people to to become yeah. a writer. I mean, there's so many great authors, and I enjoy all kinds of books. Um, I mean, of course, I love Maya Angelou. I'm reading, you know, Michelle Obama's book. I love Duff's book. <laughs> sure, I've read them a few times. Have you? I don't know if you've had a chance to check out How to Be a Man, but it's really, really fun. It's a um, read also. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. It is very good. Um, he's he's just like, again, you know, a great writer, I think, is as I've gotten older, you know, somebody who grew up being in just your, your favorite rock band. It's like, whoa, he can yeah. he can write and really and speak. So that's why I enjoy when he does these speaking engagements or uh, I, yeah. I hope he, he he writes some more. Well, his latest writing endeavor was his new um, music coming out, his solo record. Right. Underness. Because I think initially it started that he wanted to, you know, he could have written a book or columns regarding it or, you know, blogs or whatever. But instead he turned it into sort of almost like a concept album Mm -hmm. because it does, it's sort of a storytelling album and how, not to get too deep, but in a nutshell, just our country's so divisive right now. And it's just only hurting us and we need to figure something out and come together. And be more united versus being like your team, my team, you know. <laughs> so he felt that was a paramount subject matter to kind of 
bring up into the world and not to get political, but to simply bring up, hey, let's figure something out. I think that's important. That's what music has always been there for. That's why I... Yeah, there are music is. It brings everyone together in the stadium. I mean, people aren't there talking about, like, this song's better than that song. And this is, like, you're just there rocking out and you're having a great time. <laughs> right? And just yeah. like you were saying with how you can uh, over-describe something, I, you can, mm-hmm. I mean, you can overdo anything, that there are sure. um, musicians that maybe overdo it with, with politics. But I don't like when people say, don't put politics in music, because look how far back you can go. You know, with, with yeah. Vietnam and now where do you begin? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's why <laughs> it's it's great that I think that Duff is doing this and just following him and you know how uh, he was supportive of you know not just you and your daughters, but you know the whole women's march. Uh, and he'll, he'll wear yeah. certain wear certain t shirts. And I like your involvement. I know there was. I mean, thankfully this was reversed uh, quick again. Not to get political, too much, but the whole Special yeah. Olympics. <laughs> Which thing was, which, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, might have been really, I mean, a slight embarrassment for you our country, being, but that could have been really know, part of that. Yeah. That's Cause so you, important. cause you work, you work with them, uh, right? Right. Yeah. I, we're, we're ambassadors for them. And, uh, it's just such a, that was actually a good book too. I read that was Maria Shriver's book and how her parents, I believe actually started the special Olympics and how that came to be. She talks a bit about that in her book and, it's really inspiring and super cool because, you know, everyone knows the Shrivers and the Kennedys and like all the political stuff. But it's fun to hear their um, humanitarian side a bit, too, and what they did with their platform. And look at it today. It's yeah. such a huge helping thing to so many, you know, people and families. That's what it seems like the McKagans are. Are the McKagans the next uh, Kennedys? Because, you know, oh, <laughs> D- D- Duff, uh, yeah. he just visited Bruce uh, just to do that that intimate uh-huh. thing for uh, Rock Our Community, you know, uh, just the, the homeless in that yeah. area. So it wasn't just like, yeah. it wasn't like live yeah, aid. Yeah, I mean, I, we just, you know, count our blessings because you forget. It's easy to forget and focus on the negative or, you know, and obviously Duff and I and our family are, have, we're very lucky. We're beyond fortunate. I mean, I know so many bands that are just so tremendously talented and they just didn't break through or, you know, other models that were gorgeous, but, you know, they just came in at the wrong time. Right. The wrong look going on or, you know, and we have our health and, and, um, we, uh, we just, you know, it's important to do your stuff, but it's important to give back always. Did you get that from? It sounds like you got that from your your parents, and it and that seems like when I interviewed Matt and Bruce, that Duff got that, mm-hmm. and I like that being you know again passed passed down and shown to the fans of of yeah. I mean and not to you know pigeonhole to just Guns N' Roses fans, but anyone who's just a a fan of just being in the public eye or, or seeing watching sure. people in the public eye to, to, to see you guys continuing uh, to to give back is super super important. So it's, it's uh, that's why I love it. It seems like you and Duff are so, you guys were meant, you know, to be. And, Aww, yeah. you know, just that's like lucky. with all the creative yeah. stuff and all the things that you're balancing. Yeah. So if you don't mind me asking, and forgive me if I've, uh, if you've said this before, can I ask how you guys mm-hmm. met? Because I, I, I met my sure. current girlfriend on Bumble. Bumble did not exist. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, so Bumble, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. I was a, a super against it. Yeah, crazy it, but, to think, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I was like, I'm in a radio station 20 hours a day. I'm not meeting anybody. I'm on my phone. Let me try it. And it's working out. Yeah, and then and it worked out. That's so cool. Yeah, it's funny how, you know, people, sometimes people knock that whole thing. But honestly, I have two really close girlfriends who met. And um, one of them got married. And the other ones are together for a long time um, through an online dating app. I think one was match.com and she didn't want to go on there, but for her birthday, when her girlfriend signed her up, oh, oh God. <laughs> she was just dating these guys that were just no. And so she knew she wouldn't sign herself up. So. <laughs> and then she met this great guy. So you never know. Hey, and I'll say this cause this ties everything <laughs> in together. Uh, we're celebrating her, her birthday today. And she knows I just dropped her off at her apartment and she knows I'm interviewing you. She's like, I know this is a big interview, honey. Go do it. Oh, okay. she said so, that? Yeah, she knows. 
cute. Oh, that's so sweet. Tell her I said hello, <laughs> hugging her through the phone. <laughs> I will, I will. So, yeah, how did, I mean, if I, I don't okay, know if so it's a romantic met, story or what. Um, we actually met through <clears throat> sort of a blind date through a mutual friend of ours whose name is Stain. Um, he, his real name is John Stainbrook, but everyone calls him Stain. And he had known Daff for a long time before GNR and all that and these early punk rock bands and days. And then he knew me and my family because my sister was um, the first lady of Toledo, Ohio. She's, you know, the mayor's wife. And he was like sort of a stain, the guy that introduced us, sort of like a punk rock politician type of guy. So he worked for Thrasher Magazine, that skateboarding magazine. And he was going to go interview Duff because he was in Neurotic Outsiders, another okay. good band I forgot to mention earlier. Yes. And touring at the time. And um, he, um, but he knew me through my sister because um, he was like involved in the city council there. He, um, you know, he majored in poli sci and all that stuff. So he always had a fascination with politics, but also punk rock music and then journalism. So he was going to interview Duff and Rock Outsiders. And he's like, he knew I was new to LA. I didn't really know a lot of people because I've been living in New York for a long time modeling. And so he, um, he's like, you should meet. So he went to the interview and then he's like, you should, are you, um, I talked to Stain on the phone and, and then I was like, oh, my God, that's so weird. You're going to interview Duff? Because I just bought, um, I'd gone to this, like, bookstore down the street and bought all these cool books, like photography books, like coffee table books, like reading books. And one of them was a, a GNR book. This was like a used bookstore. And it was cool. And so I, I was like, hold on, let me get the book. I can help you with the interview. So I was, like, looking through the book, and I was like, oh, my God, he's actually kind of cute, this Duff guy. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was flipping through the pages, and then it, and it actually showed a picture of Matt on tour, his brother Matt. I go, oh, his brother plays music. You should talk to him about that in the interview. He plays, you know, I think trombone or sax and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, and then, um, and then I was flipping through pages, and I was like, yeah, he's cute. And then I was like, oh, he's married. Never mind, because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it showed a picture of him and his ex. And then I, um, <clears throat> so I helped him with the interview. Then he met with Duff. And then I had pictures out in Allure magazine. And so he, I don't know, he had that. And unbeknownst to me, brought it to the interview. And he was like talking to Duff and asking him the questions kind of like you're asking me. And he was like, um, yeah, I was talking to my friend Susan. And she actually had a GNR book. And she was kind of helping me with the interview. And she's a cool chick. She's a model, but she's not like model model. Like she's really down to earth, super chill, Midwest girl. <laughs> and... <laughs> And Duff, Duff's ears perked up, and he's and he, and he and and then um, he's like, "Too bad you couldn't meet her, man." But I think you're married or something. And Duff was like, "No, no, no, I'm not. I'm divorced actually now for a year." Oh. <laughs> like, oh. So then that's when the plot thickened, and and um, so then he put he called Stain called me, and luckily I picked up. And then he's like, "Here, talk to Duff on the phone." So I was like, just like, uh, okay. <laughs> Caught off guard. I didn't know he was, know he was gonna put Duff on the phone, so it was hilarious. But he's really easy to talk to, like very low key. And as Duff says, it was just like natural from the beginning. And then, so then we just kind of talked on the phone a little. And then he called me again on the tour, and and then eventually he's like, hey, well, maybe when I get back to LA from the Neurotic Outside or tour, I could pick you up and we could go out to dinner or go out to eat or something. It'd be great. I'm like, yeah, sure. That'd be really nice. And then the next time he called, I thought about it and I was like, oh, I don't really know this guy. And he's like a gnarly rock and roller. And, you know, in the book, it showed how it was like sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of, you know, mm -hmm. cliche. And so I was like, man, I'm going to pick him up. I don't want him to know where I live. So I picked him up. From the airport. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And then, but basically, we've been inseparable ever since. We really clicked. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. He's a total gentleman. So. And I yeah. like you uh, bucking stereotypes, picking him up. Yeah. I was like, and no. Because before him, dated some not so good ones. So, yeah. 
That's how it's like. And my girl is uh, from Chicago, so mid, so Midwest. Something about the Midwest here in the oh, states. Cool. They're, yeah, they're oh, I love as... her. She's a great girl. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, seriously, all Midwest Turners are, are like pretty cool people. I think I don't know. I mean, dealing with most New Yorkers in my life. I mean, I, it takes a lot for me to like myself, and I'm it's, so it's just like I don't want to be. Gotta, I got to get away from New York. You know, at least uh, yeah, you know, dating wise. <laughs> Uh, so since it's been such uh, a, a great ride, and I don't want to, you know, again, keep you here because I know you're so uh, busy with all these spinning plates that you have. Sure, yeah, no problem. Any, you know, I guess fun uh, experiences over the years uh, at a GNR or a VR concert, maybe like something that sticks out to you is like, wow, like I can't I mean, believe that I'm like here. So I know it's hard. Many. I mean, it's, you have to think about it. We just finished getting off this last GNR, not in this lifetime tour. It was. It could be this tour. One and a half years, 152 shows in 49 countries. So it all kind of blends into one fabulous show. (laughs) (laughs) People. (laughs) Um, I mean, there's just so many great shows. And like. (sighs) Do you have a favorite show, maybe? Say, like, um, whether it was a festival or maybe a certain band that opened or a certain night that. That Duff I mean, uh, looked at you really, from the stage. I mean, Madison Square Garden, selling that out, like, at MSG, that was pretty epic. I mean, the crowds in New York are so just, you know, animated and enthusiastic and just, like, they wear their heart on the sleeves and they're singing out every, you know, lyric and just it was a blast. And you seeing, you know, multi-generations out there, like, people... You see, like, people's, people and their kids and their kids' kids, like, sitting up on their shoulders, rocking out. It's just really cool. And uh, there's a lot. I mean, it was great to see Matt Coachella when that very first started in 2016 when mm-hmm. they reunited. And, um, I stayed up on my phone to watch that on Periscope. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. that's how desperate that was, it was. That was just so magical, and like, I, you know, we didn't. Nobody really knew after that, like, how many more shows there would be, and if it would work, and there's, you know, a lot going on. So, this, you know, I'm so proud of them, and and um, it's just so great. How, how do you feel now, if I may ask, just like of what's happened? Because he had his. You know, his fame with GNR, and he's had some great bands like Neurotic uh, Outsiders, and obviously fame again with uh, Velvet and, you know, writing a book. And he could have just, you know, lived his life, but just to have this come back into his life, GNR, and yeah. and, and in this capacity, do you see, I don't know, like, what, I guess what does that just mean to you? Does it mean anything to you personally, or is this just like another, the next yeah, phase of the absolutely. Susan Duff story? So, yeah, I guess what does uh-huh. it mean to you? I mean, all the bands... I, are you know I've, it's there's like joy in each of the music that Duff has you know toured on because luckily he can be picky and he doesn't do something unless he stands behind it and believes in it wholeheartedly like the band the, the lyrics the you know the if it's dangerous or you know he's not going to sign up to do some overproduced soulless drum machine thing you know what I mean mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so um that's never going to happen. So it's not who he is. You know, that's not what he enjoys. That's not his craft, not cutting it down. I'm just saying that's not who he is, you know, I gotcha. But, um, he, um, I think it's really cool because, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends in the rock and roll world, you know, who have kept it going for a long time. They never stopped. And that's awesome. So to have this thing be, you know, put on hold for 23 years and then for it to, like, come together again and come together and literally be, I think, like, one of the strongest in history yeah. <laughs> tours of the world ever. It might be, like, Seriously, second. Amen. Yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, you can't not... I mean, think if you're an Olympic athlete, that's just like you won the gold medal, you know? So, like, sure. they look at it almost like, like, um, with the most professionalism. They work really hard. They rehearse the crap out of this thing, you know, every day for months and months. And, you know, they play these three hour shows 
And like Duff doesn't even have time to go to the bathroom. He has to like pee in a cup, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's hardcore. This is right like, on. Uh, yeah. Like I've done that during radio shows, not this one, but I have done that. Yeah. Yeah. So they look at Sorry. it almost like a sport. You know what I mean? <laughs> Duff calls it calling, climbing his Meru. It's like, it came, or did you see free solo? It's like his solo, you know, mm. you train and it takes every little last ounce of anything you got to make that get there and happen. So I, I think it's sometimes like on social media, I'll see people be like, yeah, just do this. And I'm like, oh my God, they have no idea <laughs> really, truly like what it took just to get to that one concert at Coachella to then doing a leg and then signing a whole nother leg of the tour. And you know what I mean? And they're doing everything they can at all times. I think it's, it really is great. When I started this, this podcast, it was right before the, um, the reunion between Duff slash and, and Axel and, you know, all the stereotypes out there, how long, like you even said, how long would it last, whatever. And I just grew up with, yeah. like, they already had, there was no GNR, I mean, other than, you know, Axel's version. And I, I've i seen Velvet, uh, lucky enough to see them twice, uh, just oh, both cool. times. Yeah. Phenomenal. Uh, so, I don't know, just like with everyone, like, you know, the doors are dead, Zeppelin's not touring. So, to me, GNR was like that. So, But to finally s- see them together, and I was at one of those MSG shows, the one where Pink uh, came out. And, oh, at Dodger Stadium. Mm-hmm. I oh, was there too. Yeah. Oh, well, no, uh, at MSG. Did she come out? Twi- yeah. did, did she come out twice? Because she came out at MSG. Oh wait. Okay. So I think it was two shows actually with Pink. You're right. Because there was one at Dodger Stadium. It was Billy Joel. Yes. And Axel came out and Pink and Billy Joel played guitar and Axel sang. It was really fun because they swapped. You know, like that's crazy. Billy Joel playing lead guitar was really fun. <laughs> oh, I know he's such a guitarist, you know. <laughs> yeah, that must have been one of those moments then, out of everything you've experienced, being like, wow, here's a, here's a new one. Here's something I didn't ex- uh, expect yeah, to experience. I don't think anyone's ever witnessed that before. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get when you go to a GNR show. But or just a Billy Joel show. This is true. <laughs> but just yeah. to see the joy, you know, and a chance to see, you know, Duff again in the band that I grew up listening to was great. You know, uh, it was just, it's very cool. And what I often talk about is just, you know, the, the, you always see pictures of them smiling together and, and mm-hmm. I don't know, just seems like wounds can heal or it's just, it's all about positivity now. And I'm just enjoying it for, for what they've given us uh, so far. And I'm, you know, they, I know they've announced at least one more date and I'm looking forward to, of yeah. course, uh, you know, Duff's uh, album. I, I think uh, Shooter's going to, I mean, he should be coming on the show. I know Shooter uh, is just as busy as, as anyone. Uh, but he, he's Yeah, gonna, that guy is so busy. I know. He's going to be coming Crazy. on in the future. He's but got I'm, his hands in a lot of hats. <laughs> we got it. He just won a Grammy for producing, I think it's Brandy Carlisle's album. Okay, right. And, uh, oh, doing stuff with Marilyn Manson. Like, so, yeah, he's got a lot going on. And then all the TV stuff, too. But... And then, so we we know what's going on. I'm looking forward to that coming out. I know a couple of singles, but you know, with the book coming yeah. out, what's I guess what's next for you? Just going on, you know, promoting the book and 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 yeah, just, yeah. What what like what else yeah, do we expect? I have from my you? little book tour coming up. So, The Velvet Rose, my book, is coming out April 16th. It's available for pre order now, everywhere. You know, like um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, on and on and on, and um, it's, um, I'm going to, on April 13th, Duff and I, Duff will be doing a Q&A with me at uh, Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle. And then from there, we go to New York. And on April 16th, I'm at the Strand in New York. And that'll be with Jay Alexander from America's Next Top Model. <laughs> and Duff will be there, too, in support. Um, and then... Of course, I got one in San Diego on May 2nd at Warwick's Books, and there'll be more added, um, but that's what I got um, confirmed right now. And um, and I wanted to add that I um, also am doing this book, obviously, because I enjoy the creative outlet it's given me in writing, but it also, a portion of the proceeds go to Music Cares. Okay. So it's for a good cause, too. And 
I don't have time because I'm like on tour or helping out my daughters or visiting them or busy doing this, that, and the other. So I don't have time to always sit on the board of a charity. So this is kind of my roundabout way of giving back to a charity that I feel really strongly about. And Understood, I, sure. Yeah, so they're a really good, good one. Music Cares, like they've helped so many people. It's one that really is hands-on and helps people out if, you know, they're battling addiction to, you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, um, et cetera. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty great and rewarding feeling that, you know, I can do something. I can tell a story that I think people will enjoy reading. It's a nice escape. It's kind of a feel good book, but like I said, it's, Sort of warts and all. <laughs> any, you know? uh, no spoilers, of course, but any hint as to like, um, maybe like an outline version of a story that we, we perhaps could read or we, we, we want to keep yeah. this? I mean, yeah, on the back of my book, I guess on any book, you kind of have to put, you know, a little paragraph or two about it. But I can say, I can tell you in a nutshell, it's basically my book, The Velvet Rose, is, you know, it takes place in the early 90s. And it's told, it has a lead, you know, it's told through the eyes of this this young girl, Scarlett, and she's 23 years old, and um, and she's a painter, but she's also a high fashion model, because she's got to pay her bills, right? Yeah. <laughs> and she finds herself working in some of the world's most infamous fashion capitals, and then as her adventure continues, she meets Johnny of the this band, the Westies, and... Um, and there's sort of, it's an up and coming band on the cusp of superstardom. Mm. <laughs> and then what ensues is an unhinged ride of a novel. And it just follows Scarlett actually through first person. So it's almost like you're reading her diary at times. Cool. Um, and then as she navigates her life through fame, addiction, and fidelity, and all the ups and downs of dating a legendary musician from one of the biggest rock bands in history. So it's kind of, um, you know, it's coming of age, but I would say if it were, if you were to kind of view it as movies, what movies it kind of is similar to, I would say it's a little bit of maybe reality bites. Okay, nice. Meets almost famous. Mm, <laughs> meets perfect. Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, there's got some humor in there for sure. Because these great. guys are trying to figure their way out. You know, they're kids. They're they're just on the brink of it. So. Oh, I, I love it. I can't. I can't. Part. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Any plans for? Because I know it took you a while to get this out. Uh, but any plans Thanks. for perhaps an audio book or or just? Yeah, I don't know yeah. It's, actually, okay. I just signed a thing on Audible for an audio book, and that will be out. I think the book's coming out April 16th, but the audio book is. I believe a couple weeks later. So it'll be on okay. Audible. And then also is available for download, you know, on Kindle and all that as well worldwide. Cause I have a lot of fans asking like, how do I get it in Sweden? How do I get it in Argentina? How sure. do I, you know, <laughs> so it is available worldwide um, from April 16th on downloadable. And then the Audible will probably be a few weeks later. And I have a great reader who has won awards and she's, very good storyteller, much better than me, um, who's done, I think, um, she did the, I think the Ruth Bader Ginsburg book and um, Gloria Steinem. Like, she's a very powerful voice. Um, but because there's a lot of um, traveling in my book, and each chapter they go to different cities or countries. So there's a lot of accents, too. <laughs> so I said that whoever narrates this book really has to be a legitimate you know, get the authenticity of the accents oh, okay. on certain parts, you know? <laughs> so I guess she's tremendously qualified in that area, especially too. So I'd hate for someone in Italy to hear it and be like, oh my gosh, they just murdered my <laughs> accent, you know? <laughs> That'd be a bummer. I'd feel so bad, you know? Okay. So, no, that's, like a, that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That you're putting as equal effort into the, uh, the audio version. So, you know, I, yeah. I mean, you, you, you obviously have enough now, but are you even thinking about, whether it be a sequel or just writing another book. Are you even thinking yeah, about that? I think I've been asked, well, actually I had a meeting with a company, I won't say names, but they do a lot of feature films to, you know, huge Netflix shows that are kind of interested in it. Nice. It would make for a nice, um, yeah, 
film or or Netflix or you know show series docu series kind of thing, but Agreed. not docu series. I should say series. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. But um, um, I think it would be a really good fit for that. Um, if anyone's listening and they're interested, you can you can write. Write me on my social media, <laughs> just like you did on Twitter, right? That's a good way to get a hold of me. Oh, on social media. Yeah, I didn't even mention Twitter, it. at Sue Holmes McKagan. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, because I I know because you, you're so crazy and it's obviously it's all good. Uh, but I tweeted at you. I'm like waiting for Susan Holmes McKagan to call, and you're like five <laughs> minutes on Twitter. Boom. This world is is unbelievable. Oh my god, that's hilarious. But I really hope that happens because you started the conversation with all the the rock docs that are coming out and. I mean, yeah, I don't know about Sorry you. Born, Bohemian Rhapsody, The Dirt. Now you got Elton John's one coming out. David Bowie's got one coming out. The Sex Pistols, and right? I, yeah, that's right. The Sex Pistols. So I think, I think it's, um, you know, like I said, it's it's a lead female protagonist. So it's kind of like the princess saves the prince in my my book a little bit. So it's a little different spew on. The hundredth one done in the same exact format. Um, even though, you know, I enjoy those ones a lot. I think they're awesome and I'm addicted to them just like everyone else. They're amazing and such a pleasure to watch and relaxing and enjoying and escapism. I think it, it'll be a, a fun, different paradigm. You know, I, I don't know about you, but if you watch the Oscars, it's all about the year of the female. So I think it's perfect timing for that too <laughs> i agree and even though i i enjoyed the dirt it's it's interesting you know re, uh, watching it in 2019 you know with all the the shenanigans that we've known about you know i read the dirt when it first came out and being a fan mm-hmm. of the crew it's just interesting so yeah. that included uh, w- with a fam- female perspective on you know a certain era i think is important too because we don't want to lose that time in history but uh, right, you know, right. it's to get a, a viewpoint of a female uh, on that time. I think is really, you know late, late eighties, early nineties, or whatever, what have, what have you, uh, is super important. Yeah. So I just, I'm yeah, excited. It'll, it'll spin, it spins it a different way for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, my it's good. My book it's young, but you know I think guys will dig it. Girls, women, it's a great book. Like, my daughters are reading it, but Duff loves it. You know what I mean? It's just awesome. kind of a cool fit and for different reasons, for different people, for sure. It's well, not just, like, a romance novel. It's not just a rock and roll book, you know? It, I mean, at the end of the day, it is kind of like a rock and roll love story, sort of like Sid and Nancy a little bit, too, yeah. I guess. I like it. If I didn't know who you were and it was just called the Velvet Rose, you know, novel, I would have thought like a Fabio would be on the cover. But I know. Oh, it, really? <laughs> you know, oh, that's hilarious. The Velvet Rose. Oh, no, it's not like that. It's it's not. Um, I'm teasing. It's unvarnished, but it's. I really took pride in the writing and it's not a, like a salacious, like trashy beach read. It's. Um, you know, let's see. I wish I had the, let me see if I can. Okay. Well here, can I just read two sentences from the book? Go for it, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. For the writing, maybe readers can get a, a nod of kind of the vibe. So it's, um, this is what it says from the book. As the sun set behind the stage and the lemony sweet smell of magnolia kissed the sultry air, the stars shone like diamonds in the midnight blue velvet sky. Johnny's ever-enthralling spirit and soulful vocals turn this grim life and its poverty and strife into inspiring lyrical poetry. So that's kind of the tone of my book as more, you know, kind of like Duff's journey or myself. You know, it's not like a glamorous, bratty, rich kid. (laughs) You know? I got you. Like, this guy's trying to sing his way out of, you know, where he's at being pretty destitute and his folks not being so, well, his mom was cool. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> dad had some issues to work through, but, you I know, know. It's, it's more of a, gotcha. you know, uh, I want, it's fast paced, but I want people to enjoy the writing in it as well, you know. 
Well, I'm uh, right too. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. And you know, yeah, it took a, a long time, and I'm sure in retrospect, like this is just you. You think about it, like, hey, this is when it was meant to come out. So, just congratulations on Aww, you know, on the book. You. I really uh, appreciate it. And what's gonna what's to come? I know I'm I'm excited after the book. I really do hope that Netflix thing does happen because I, I you know, I'm sure it's a not just it's not my own thought, but I feel like Rock Docs are like the next Marvel kind of movies if they get them right of course right yeah and Aww, well, thanks i can't thank you enough for your time because obviously you lot to me that that you're gonna read it and you're interested in learning more about it and seeing it on another you know way and and oh also if you get sure. the book now on at uh, rare bird um you have giveaways is that what you're talking about yeah i'm doing giveaways but also if you are on rare bird it's only there at my publishers that um, there's never been released before music from Duff and Flash is on it too. Oh wow! A couple of songs that are the Westies. They're the band in the book. <laughs> so oh. it's kind of like um, Stillwater and Almost Famous. Okay. You, know, you had Mike McCready on there. You had Nancy Wilson on there, but they were under a pseudonym. So it's kind of fun. This is a seven-inch vinyl. Two never released or heard before songs ever okay. from the '90s that Duff recorded with Slash um, that you can get. And they only pressed I, like a thousand copies. So I don't even know if it's still available or it's sold out, but um, it's kind of a really cool, exclusive, you know, special thing you can get that goes with the book, The Velvet Rose. So, cause the band in the book are called the Westies. So, <laughs> so it's kind of a fun musical treat there too. Awesome. Well, I mean, Susan Holmes McKagan, I mean, I can't thank you enough for your, your time. You know, model, uh, I'm sure actress, you've acted some, now author. If you ever want to add radio DJ to your resume, you can always come back on. Oh, you can, <laughs> you're sweet. Uh, you, it's, it's a lot harder than it than it seems, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you have to be just so natural. And it's, I don't know. It's just t- reading that dialogue, the narrative from my book, I'm like bumbling over my words. <laughs> like, okay, wait, how did you just talk to people about stuff so easily <laughs> i still bumble but i fight through it i make i make that part of my charm i think uh but yeah i know it, it's i mean i've been doing it for a while i'm certainly i'm sure how you perceive yourself how duff perceives i'm it's i'm never satisfied i want to get better at it sometimes yeah. I, I listen back and you know and i can think about the uh like the nine years right let's just say uh-huh. uh I have to accept, like, once I'm done with the podcast, I got to put it out there. I can pick and choose and, like, how I say things or pronounce. Uh, sure. At some point, I, you know what? A better analogy would be when I would apply to FM stations. You have to make a, a radio demo reel that's, like, two minutes of your uh-huh. best of. And oh, like, wow. I, I'm like, yeah, no pressure there. <laughs> right. I'm like, I don't like my diction in this, but if you keep trying harder and harder, it doesn't sound natural. And sometimes you got to be like, hey, mm. this is me. I got to put it out there. So I'm glad you've... You know, you put yourself out there, cloaked in a little yeah. fiction, but essentially you've you've, you've put yourself out there. Uh, so yeah, if you ever, because yeah. I've done this before with, including with with Squires. So if you want to come back as a as a co host to perhaps, uh, oh, great, yeah, that'd be fun. I'd love inter- to. Interview somebody. That's pretty uh, radical. It's it's tough. That's my my. I have a I have a soundbite of your husband. That's pretty uh, radical. Do you want to say it's pretty radical? <laughs> He's. <laughs> Radical is the theme, uh, if like the Pee Wee theme word of the of this show, because I don't know why rad oh. is used a lot. Um, okay. I, I don't know if you know uh, Brain, uh, the former drummer. It's rad. He would he came on and would that was, he said it so oh, often. Yeah, yeah, I I do know Brain a little bit. Yeah, he's super talented, great guy. And then there was an interview with uh, Axel and Duff on what it was like a Mexican TV or something a couple of years ago, right after the, the you know announced not in this lifetime and. He's just staring at a- Axel talk about him joining ACDC, and Duff mm-hmm. just goes, That's pretty radical. I don't know, it just made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sorry. I, I, yeah, I didn't get to see that one, but I know that was a big deal because they never do press ever. So, <laughs> no, I'm aware. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm well so aware. I feel like you're the isolated one. It's just, you know, they just all just, no, of course not. I'll put this out there because that I, was thing guns and roses is always like that they're all kind of mysterious even their billboards are like they don't show a logo in their band and like we're playing here and list all the dates they just show like a date and you're like i think that's gnr i don't know like that's kind of they're like 
Banksy of art, you know, <laughs> just, mm. you got to figure it out. It's like mysterious. I, I honestly, I enjoy it. I know fa- some fans can be frustrated by it, but I'm like, you know what? This is one of the reasons why I like the band and all the six degrees of Kevin Bacon that I connect on this podcast, <laughs> including, you know, you. It's just, uh, it's just an interesting web that this uh, one little band is is cast, and, and to learn about, you know, you a little bit and, and growing up in this new book. Again, thank you for for your time, and well, I appreciate thank you. it. I really appreciate it. And yeah, some great questions. That was very radical. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 